we get started with the show, we wanted to draw your attention to our crowdfunding page on Patreon. If you've been enjoying Always Take Notes, please do consider supporting us there. It helps us to keep the podcast going. If you support us on Patreon, you can get a great selection of rewards, including a shout out on the show and a selection of successful magazine pitches. Thanks to our latest donor, Clara Vila. Clara hasn't responded to our email asking for more information about her, but thank you very much for your support nonetheless. If you pledge $10 a month, you get a free two-month trial to Otter worth $26 alongside the other rewards. Otter offers automated transcription and live note-taking for in-person and virtual meetings. I found it to be a huge help when organising interview material. You also get access to a series of mini-episodes from previous guests on the show in which they answer three revealing questions. The latest episode features Shirin Kale, and here's a snippet. One trait that I think a good writer should have is I think you should be very decisive. I think most bad writing is indecisive writing. It's where the writer doesn't know what they're trying to say um, and it gets a bit baggy around the edges. I think a good writer is somebody who knows their own mind and knows, knows the world that they're observing and knows what their perception is of that world and sort of decisively pushes forward in that way. So I think if you want to be a good writer, you should try to be decisive. Hello and welcome to Always Take Notes. In this episode, Rachel and myself spoke with novelist Simon Scarrow. We spoke to Simon about his interest in historical fiction, about the surprisingly varied readership of his novels, and about the economic benefits to writing a series. It's a great episode, and we hope you enjoy it. Welcome, Simon, to Always Take Notes. Thank you for your time. I wondered if we could start um, with a general discussion of your interest in historical fiction, where it began, when you want to decide you want to tell stories set in the past. Um, well, it, it, it's two things, really. I mean, firstly, um, it's great history teachers. Uh, when I was at school, um, there was one particular teacher, a guy called Jonathan Mills, who realised that the best way to teach um, the younger students uh, an interest in history was to teach it as a, as a kind of soap opera. So um, he would get to a certain stage and he'd say, well, Henry VIII could have married Catherine of Aragon or we shall find out tomorrow. So it had a kind of wonderful effect on us because we'd rush back the next day to catch up on the latest episode of, of British history. Um, and that's what really fired us up. And then, of course, when we started doing A-levels and it became more academic, um, then it's a different kind of approach. And he was very good at shifting that um, to make us interested in history as a story to history as a means of um, analysis of past events and weighing evidence up and, and that sort of thing. So it was really down to teachers. And then uh, on the fiction side of things, it was uh, in my father, because he's a, an avid historical fiction fan. And I was having a, a day at home ill and he thrust a copy of C.S. Forrester's The Happy Return into my hands. And uh, this is one of the um, Horatio uh, Hormler books. And it was just absolutely spellbinding read. And I thought, my goodness, you know, because uh, up to that time, I'd, I'd been reading, <laughs> mostly, if I'm honest, Asterix and Tintin. And uh, <laughs> this is what sorted me out into novels. And then historical fiction was the thing I enjoyed most. And it was only um, when I put some effort into trying to become published myself, I, I, I made the classic beginner's mistake of looking at what was selling in the bookshops and thinking that's what I should write, rather than thinking about what I actually wanted to read. So it was only when I sat down, I thought, well, really, I want kind of a Roman version of, of the Hormler series. And um, nobody was doing anything like that at the time. So that's where I stepped in. With your C.S. Forrester, did you ever read one of his lesser known books called The General? Yeah. Which yeah, I bought yeah. years ago, which I think is a sort of extraordinary... I, haven't, I read it when I was a teenager, just after I'd left the army, actually, but a really kind of very, and, and from that sort of mid-30s vantage point of looking back at the First World War, but very powerful piece of writing is my memory of it. Powerful, but also at the same time quite brave, because, you know, here's a guy that's you know, saying, kind of, he's doing the same sort of thing you were doing, but uh, much, much, much earlier um, in a fictional kind of context, saying, look, okay, if these people are in charge and they have these kinds of limitations and, you know, they're, they're put into positions of big responsibility and power, by force of circumstances, as tends to happen when a war starts and people get promoted very quickly, um, you're in a dangerous situation, really. And I thought um, 
he was quite a foresight. You know, there's quite a lot of foresight in that book in, in, in many ways, but equally a certain amount of courage in being that blunt, um, you know, knowing, given the kind of patriotic context in which he was writing. And what was it that attracted um, attracted you to the Roman period in particular? I read that you were an avid watcher of I, Claudius, when you were younger as well. Um, well, that would be the Latin teachers. Um, so this was the other half of the, the teaching equation. Yeah, we had two guys. Um, initially, there was a guy called Gordon Rodway, um, who sounded just like Richard Burton. And he used to um, have a pipe. And so he'd be sort of stuffing the tobacco in, lighting up, and then there'd be plumes of smoke everywhere. And he would disappear behind them, and then he would just talk about Roman culture. I mean, I, I was never particularly good at Latin as a language. Um, and when he started talking about the culture, then the whole thing became kind of interesting. And equally, uh, one of the um, things they were experimenting with with A-level when I was doing A-level history, there was a Roman Britain um, paper that was an option. So... Um, you know, everything kind of came together rather nicely. In actual fact, I think I would say uh, at least half the research um, for the first book was already done by the time I was 18. And with uh, historical novels, this sort of central question is is how much fidelity to, to the past, to, the, to, to what actually went on, happened. What's your approach to that? How close do you feel obliged to hew to historical reality? And how do you go about bringing in the fictional elements? Well, I, I think, you know, there is... I, I tend to take a very Puritan view of this. Um, if you're writing historical fiction and you change anything uh, from the historical record that you're conscious of, then it's up to you to put that in the author's note at the end and explain why you did it. Um, and I believe there's a sort of an unwritten contract between writers of historical fiction and readers that they trust you to get it as as right as you possibly can. And if for any reason you take any shortcuts, then you own up to it in the, in the author's note. But there is a wider issue, of course, which is, um, and, and you probably won't thank me for this being a sort of a, a non-fiction writer, is that um, history is as much a, a, a narrative and, a, and, a, and a, a, in that way, we're kind of imposing a, a fictional kind of construct on facts, even if we're writing history. Because history, as we know, I mean, it, it, it's what may have actually happened. Then it's what the historians tell us happened. Then it's what we think happened because of the kind of residual uh, uh, impact that various history that we had from school, the, our interest in history, what we read, that imposes itself. And then, of course, the, the final tier is what his, the, the history we're told that happens via things like television series and films. And that kind of mishmash, when it all gets together, creates a very kind of nuanced idea of what um, any kind of historical fact might actually be. I mean, you can, you can pin down things, even, you know, even if you were to say, take a fact, that's something that I remember being taught at school that 1857, the great, you know, the Indian mutiny. And, and when I was uh, doing my thesis at university, one of my friends was a guy called Ravi, who, who'd, who'd come to Britain to do a, a history of the Indian people, but all the records he needed were actually owned in the archives of the East India Company. So he had to come from India to Britain to study his own country. And he looked at me and he said, yes, we call that the first patriotic war. So, you know, even if we sort of nail down a, something that uh, sounds like it's a, an incontrovertible fact, 1857, the Great Indian Mutiny, immediately, the moment you kind of give it another label, suddenly it opens up that whole range of ambiguity and counter, counter narratives that, occur, that frequently occur in history. So I think, you know... Um, Historical fiction is, or you can look at it either way, historical fiction is just a branch of history, and, fr and frankly, most history is a branch of fiction. That certainly seems to be a strand on, on television. I mean, I wrote recently um, about various period dramas that seem to take the approach that we can't know history, so why not play around with it and have some fun with it? Um, where do you start with your research? I know you said that you'd done quite a lot of it by the age of 18, but when you're starting a new book, what's the sort of starting point Um yeah, for your research? Well, it depends. Um, I mean, something like the, uh, if I'm writing about ancient Rome, then, the, you know, there's a whole wealth of stuff. I mean, there's, there's endless amounts of books you can read. There's some quite good um, stuff that's published on the on the web these days. Um, so, for example, I, I didn't know about the existence of a particular fort I wanted to write about. Um, and then uh, I, I was looking for something separate. Then, so I came across a reference to a fort that's in the Jordanian desert. And um, there was nothing in... There was just a few handful of references in, in most of the historical books I, 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 uh, I came across. 
And then when I was in Jordan and um, I asked our host of the king, it was the king who'd sort of asked us over to have a look round. And he, uh, he said, yeah, you know, I don't know where that is. And he called in his Minister of Tourism and said he didn't know where it was either. Um, and then it was only a film director um, who was doing scouting work for Hollywood companies who said, yeah, I know where the case of Bashir is. Um, so, you know, he was able to do that. First of all, I think it's important if you can go to the place where the book is set, because quite often you're going to see things and um, there are going to be qualities of being in a particular place that you cannot replicate by reading Rough Guide or anything like that. So, for example, you know, in the Jordanian desert, for example, uh, because there's no humidity, you can see crystal clear, vast distances. Now, that's not something you would appreciate unless you were actually there yourself. And if you're walking down the Nile, um, it's a bit hard to appreciate how hot it gets uh, at 9.30 in the morning unless you've actually been there. So it's things like that. And also the, the peculiar smells you get along the Nile. So it's things like that that you need to kind of build into it when you're trying to recreate a, a setting in, in that way. The second thing I think is um, reenactors. They're very, very useful, um, particularly the rather large number of Roman reenactors we have who... Uh, well, quite educated in terms of um, experimenting with the kit and finding out what's possible, what's not. Um, coupled with them, you have um, experimental archaeologists, people like Peter, uh, Peter Connolly, I think his name was, he's dead now. But he wrote a brilliant book called Rome, uh, Greece and Rome at War. And I had been taught at school that uh, the Romans invented the javelin the way they did so that you could throw these things at uh, oncoming barbarians. The shield would pierce the, the, the javelin would pierce the shield and bend so that they had to discard their shield and they couldn't throw it back and things like this. So um, just apparently there was only one or two ancient sources that sort of mentioned this, but this is what they were teaching as, as kind of law. And then um, Peter spent two years making javelins and throwing them at sheets of plywood to try and get them to do the same thing. And of course, it never happened. So he worked out that the reason why they have that very long, slender bit of iron behind the head and the weight was to pierce the shield sufficiently far to skewer the guy behind it. It was nothing to do with bending or making it impossible to throw back. So you have that kind of um, experiential level of historic, historical understanding. So they're looking at things and putting things into effect and seeing how they might work. There's a, an ex-British Army officer called uh, John Petty who served in Burma, I think it was, during the war. And he was in charge of the mule train. So he was uh, in charge of a mule train for a battalion. So he knew exactly how many mules were needed to carry food and how much food you know, each mule itself consumed and therefore would able to, was able to work out that any Roman uh, military uh, detachment could be no more than sort of five days away from its supply point. Now, it's things like that, you know, that uh, you can use to make the thing feel more real. And then finally, of course, there's the endless amounts of books that are written on, on the subject. So you kind of immerse yourself in all three things in order to glue together a, a kind of credible uh, lived in feel to the depiction of Rome that you're doing or any other historical period. I came across some of these um, experimental archaeologists recently, actually, because I was writing a piece much to Rachel's amusement about blisters for um, a running magazine. And it turns out that there were... There was someone who reconstructed Roman footwear and then got a group of students to march over the Alps with it. Um, and some of them flaked and they had terrible difficulty on tarmac, but apparently it was quite good on uh, on undulating terrain. I was going to say, with, with this process of kind of walking the ground that came up with Kate Moss, who we, we interviewed as well a few weeks ago, has that been something you've been able to do since the beginning of your writing career? Um, or, you know, is it something, were you, were you able when you were starting out to go abroad and things like that? Or is it as it's become more successful, that's become more of a feasible thing? And now, do you have a sort of research budget from your publishers or how does it how does that bit work well um you'll you'll probably find it's it's no coincidence that the first five books were set in britain <laughs> makes it very cheap to get around maiden castle and places like that um of course when uh you know i started making enough money from the books then and thinking okay well now we can afford to shift the action overseas and there's a budget then to make sure you go and see explore the, the ground where it's set um so I mean, you know, I know plenty of writers who bluff it and uh, grab a hold of a copy of, you know, Rough Guide or something like that and, and you know, work on it from that point of view. But I really don't think there's a substitute for personal experience. 
Um, and uh, luckily, the books were successful enough that I could you know, fund those. The other kind of thing, you know, there, there are practical limitations as well. When I was walking down the Nile, um, you know, you, you, there are quite a few army bases north of um, Cairo, which come right into that. So you have to make massive kind of detours, um, you know, that, so there are things like that. Uh, I was lucky enough to go to Palmyra before um, the ISIS thing kicked off. Now that's not really an option. I mean, there, there are certain... Um, but there was a recent book I was set in that area, and uh, there's no way I was going to go to uh, to research that on the ground. So it, it's I think as the world becomes a slightly more dangerous place, those sorts of options are going to become more limited. And in terms of how you develop your characters, is that something that you're doing on the page, or do you give a lot of thought to it before you put pen to paper or start typing? Um, I put a lot of thought to it before I started the series. Um, because I thought, okay, if we're going to be writing about the Roman army, then the best way to be doing that is to, look, as it were, looking over the shoulder of a recruit. And so that that immediately gave me Cato. And I thought, well, what's Cato going to be like? And I thought, if he's going to be, because I wanted him to be someone who was very, very aware of the of the bigger picture. So he needed to be someone quite educated. So I thought, well, OK, so it's me as a student basically uh, joining the Roman army. And um, and then, of course, you need someone who's going to be your your uh, mentor. And I was thinking back to because uh, the nearest I got to the army was uh, the OTC at university. And because uh, I was thinking of joining at one stage and then um, the Falklands War kicked off. And I thought, you know, this is one of the most ludicrous wastes of life. Um, and I just don't want to have any part of this. So I just joined the ATC at university. And the people who really impressed me were the um, NCOs. And it, partly because they have the, the world's most formidable collection of invective and insults I think I've ever come across. And some of this stuff is hysterically funny and you can't stop yourself laughing, which of course gets them enraged and they get even funnier still. So there was one particular guy who looked a bit like Bob Hoskins and when he got going, you know, he was in total Bob Hoskins mode. And I thought, yeah, yeah, it's him. He's macro. You know, that's the guy he needs to be sort of trained by. So they, I thought about it in quite some depth before I actually started writing. And since then, um, you know, I'm now writing the 20th book in the series. Uh, I feel a bit like I'm an amanuensis. You know, these guys are, are so well developed in my head that every time I sit down to write a book, it's like going on holiday with them. And um, they're just dictating, and I just try to keep up with them as I type on the keyboard. What, what's the kind of role of, of being an English language writer writing about a you know, very different period? I, I think of this because of you know, Barbarians, the Netflix show that came out, which has spoken Latin in, right? And is a sort of innovation on that. How do you, you know, in terms of choosing your register and the, the way, the kind of type of English you're writing for characters who are not speaking English, if they if they were real, how do you walk? How do you walk that one? Well, um, my first point about that, I think, is because this is this, this is a question that has come up once in a while. Um, I could write it in Latin, but my sales would be fairly small. <laughs> um, so, the second point is, I thought, well, how do I, you know what do Roman soldiers actually sound like? And because before I'd started this um, series, most of the books seem to be written from an you know imperial, you know, the emperor's point of view or a general or something like this. Um, and I thought, well, you know, the, the nature of the, the trade really hasn't changed a great deal in 2000 years. I mean, the Roman army was a professional army, you know, it had very kind of regimental traditions. Um, so there were cert certain homologies. And I thought, well, you know, then make them sound like a, you know, modern Scotties um, and, and you know, give it that sort of feel. And I think in a way that is a given it a, a sense of um, the similitude that certainly a lot of military readers buy into. And I think a lot of um, you know, civilian readers sort of read it and think, yeah, it sounds like it, it might be real and credible to them. So it's a, it's about, as you say, finding a register. And, and, and for me, the register wasn't um, any kind of theeing and thouing. It was modern British army transported into a, a kind of Roman setting. I read part of that um, register was swearing and you had, I can't remember which swear word in particular, but your publisher was like, you can't buy it. <laughs> Those soldiers would not be using that word at that time. And you sort of went back to your sources and said, well, no, they did. Well, there's a wonderful book called The Latin Sexual Vocabulary, um, written by an academic, which is hysterical, frankly. 
And so she's been examining a lot of graffiti and she's uh, and um, so worked up a sort of list of these things. And there's a, a there's, so I, I, you know, one of the phrases that the Romans invented was cocksucker. So I thought, well, OK, I'll, you know, I'll have one of them call somebody else a cocksucker. Um, and I mean, she gives a lot of kind of gloss to this because she says, well, there is a sort of um, a politics that goes with this in, in, in a sexual politics in, in Roman times. So, you know, um, if a woman was on top of the guy, then the guy was doing it wrong, you know, because he was kind of being in a submissive pose. So there's a certain sort of social hierarchy in, in, Roman, in Roman sex. And, um, you know, if, if somebody's, uh, anybody's sucking somebody else off, that's also a kind of thing that puts you further down the pecking order. So Gallus, you know, the cocksucker is, is, is quite a potent kind of insult in, in Roman times. I see it certainly feels like it is today. So uh, anyway, I put it in. She said, well, we can't have this. This is some crass, vulgar Americanism. I said, no, no, this, this is Gallus potato. You know, it's, it's authentic Latin. They invented this one. Um, but she, you know, then it comes back to this thing we were talking about earlier about history. You know, she has this kind of um, idea in her head about how Romans uh, sound, which is entirely predicated upon probably watching too many episodes of I Claudius and uh, swords and sandals things and, and, and reading the, the sort of snootier elements of Roman literature um, like uh, Cicero and so on. So she doesn't sort of see it in those terms. And she has this idea of what Romans sounded like. And of course, you know, one of the great tragedies of history is that the vernacular of the, you know, the, the ordinary people in the working class is often the very first thing that gets erased from the record. Um, we, you know, we've got a fairly, fairly good insight into people who, who run the show because they were voluminous in, in their sort of writing. But working class people basically get consigned to graffiti. I mean, it's not you know, that, and the odd occasional letter. This is one of the things that's so wonderful about the letters that are being um, dug up at Vindolanda um, on the Hadrian's Wall that we're now getting sort of letters written by ordinary soldiers. There are, there are others. I mean, there are some quite well-preserved ones that they found in Egypt because of the, the lack of humidity. A lot of these things have survived. So we do have some uh, records of what ordinary Romans sounded like on paper. But of course, what we don't have is that sort of sense of them, you know, shouting each other down in the street, which is what I, I had to think about in terms of uh, recreating my version and my take of ancient Roman and life in the Roman army. A similar thing came up. We spoke to William Boyd a few weeks ago and he was talking about, yeah, putting the swearing back in the First World War because people think that soldiers didn't, didn't swear then. I wanted to ask about your, your readership of your novels and, and the breadth of it, saying from the very young to the very old, but also that you were surprised when it turned out that a third of your readers were female. Is that, do you have your readership in mind while you're writing? Or what, what do you think accounts for the breadth of appeal that the novels have? I think one of the things that you, know, you should do if you're, if you're going to be writing any sort of lengthy series or you know, possibly even any kind of historical fiction is not to overthink it in a way um, and try and second guess who your readership is. Because I, I, I thought I did. I thought, OK, you know, I'll be writing these adventure stories. And I was thinking primarily of someone like my dad, you know, uh, a guy who works in a bank commuting to work, and that's the kind of thing he'd read on the train. So I was quite surprised when there were as many female readers um, as there were, and how much they were kind of into macro, uh, which I hadn't really anticipated. Um, they clearly like a bit of rough or something. I don't know what it is. But um, and again, with the age range, I thought I was writing for adults. And um, uh, then when I started going to literary festivals and historical events, um, I was surprised that these sort of eight-year-olds, you know, staggering up under piles of books to get more signed, who were clearly reading this stuff. And it's one of those things. I think the publishing industry reinforces these very arbitrary barriers, particularly with someone like Penguin. When I was writing young adult fiction, they said, no, no, we have kind of set up to seven, seven to uh, nine, nine to 12, and above 12. And in actual fact, of course, that's a, that's a very arbitrary division of the, the readership. And you'll get kids who will read quite adult stuff quite early on and, and have no problem with that. And equally, you'll have um, quite mature people dipping back into young adult fiction. Um, so, you know, it's, I think we need to be a little bit more flexible in our, our thinking about the readership in these things. Uh, it'd be great if the publishers would, that's for sure. Message from our sponsor, Vitsu. Marta's story. If only each shelf could talk, reflected Marta, a Vitsu customer since 2004. Her shelving system began modestly and has grown over the years. It travelled with her from London to Valencia and now Amsterdam. 
This is the fifth time Marta has bought from Vitsu. Every time she speaks with her personal Vitsu planner, Robin, who reorganized her bookshelves to fit her Spanish walls and her Dutch hoose. He even sent her extra packaging to protect her shelves with each move. You might say that their relationship has become a friendship over the years. Marta knows she is valued and trusts the advice Robin gives. If your shelves could talk, what would they say? Vitsu 606 Universal Shelving System is a modular, adaptable kit of parts. It can form the perfect home for your books and even the desk from which to write one. Visit vitsu.com, V-I-T-S-O-E.com or request a free brochure via email at vitsu.com by quoting ATN 606. Vitsu, makers of long living furniture by Dieter Rams. Could we trace back now to the beginning of your career? Um, you mentioned going to bookshops and sort of looking at what was popular and what was selling and thinking maybe you should write something along those lines. Did you then have sort of experiments with novels before you did your um, Under the Eagle series? Yep, I have three uh, novels gathering dust in a drawer, which uh, I wrote after I graduated. Uh, one of which was a, um, a sort of a post-apocalypse survival story thing. Um, I was, you know, I had a lot of fun doing this, and I think it's a useful thing to do because uh, you need to firstly convince yourself you can write a full-length novel. That that takes a lot of time and effort, and it's a big commitment. And once you've done the first one, then you realise, okay, well, it's not such a big thing as I thought. I can start doing some other stuff. Um, the second one was um, I was a bunch of bunch of students who get together to cultivate a new kind of drug, and um, that goes swimmingly for them until they come across real drug dealers, and then uh, the whole thing goes a bit pear-shaped. And the third one was, a, oh, yes, a detective novel set in um, the Bahamas because my father was living and working out there at the time. And it was a phenomenal location because the corruption there was absolutely incredible. We, um, we used to live next door to the prime minister in the Bahamas. And, um, and it was a fairly, you know, you could have a $100,000 salary. And then all of a sudden he's, he's paying for a, a $7 million house to be built just down the road. And... <laughs> Because <laughs> what's happening is all the drugs are coming up from South America. The Bahamas was a transshipment point, and they were going into Florida on uh, what we used to call cigarette boats, which are these huge um, engines on the back of speedboats that could go really, really fast. Um, or they were flying them in on, on airplanes. So, you know, the drugs, the corruption was just incredible. And, you know, we, I've had guys in, in, Florida, in um, Bahamas trying to sell me guns, sell me drugs, you know. And then we found one day, uh, one Christmas morning, my younger brother and I came across on the beach a sail bag um, about five feet long, three feet across, two and a half feet across, filled with cocaine. And we thought, we're rich. <laughs> and then it kind of occurred to us that somebody has lost this and may come looking for it. And it's probably good if we get away from it as quickly as possible. But um, it was a fantastic location for... Um, all these kind of bizarre characters and criminality um and i just you know thought well, that's got to be a detective novel so uh, i wrote that and then before i and again but these were all things i wrote from a point of view of trying to second guess what the market was actually after um and it was only when i i thought well no actually i want to write something i want to read um that i, I settled on the roman project and what was the mechanics of of getting an agent of getting it published and so forth how did, did you write a proposal or submit the whole manuscript we really like to try and lift the lid on the podcast onto the, you know how people how people got into it there is a lot of bad advice you get when you're starting out and a lot of it comes in in terms of books which say how to become a, a published author and become immensely rich in 10 easy steps and there seems to be about three or four of these books that are published um every season and you're thinking well if, if there were any good then there would only ever be one of those wouldn't there so it's, it's, it's basically that kind of self-help guide thing that uh, is, is a minor little industry in itself. So I was reading a lot of those and they were all saying, well, what you do is write a speculative letter, then a sample chapters and you send it off to the agent. You wait for it to come back. And if they don't like it, you do it to the next agent and so on. And anybody that tried this approach, I think um, it's, it's so dispiriting and it takes so long. So what I did was I thought, well, um, if I'm writing uh, Roman adventure fiction, who's writing sort of that, you know, Bernard Cornwall type novels, whatever. So I went through and made a list of the agents who are representing those kinds of authors. And basically I phoned them up, spent an afternoon calling them all up and um, 
And if they weren't interested, cost, you know, I saved a huge amount of postage and time, crossed them off the list. So, um, and those who were interested said, yeah, we had a conversation about it and they seemed keen. So I knew that when I sent it in, there would be a sort of sympathetic pair of eyes looking at it the moment it went through, the, you know, fell through the, uh, the letterbox. And very, very quickly, um, I latched on to an agent called Wendy Suffield, who um, said, yeah, I really like it. Love the first three chapters. Can I see the rest of the book? At that stage, you know, I had to sort of show, you know, say, look, there, it's all in there still. So um, I had to write the book, rest of the book really quickly. And then she did a very, very useful thing in teaching me how to edit because she said, look, your first man, you know, your first draft is 140,000 words. I'm not going to submit it until it's 100,000 words. So I had to go back and cut out an immense amount of material. And that was a real education because um, you get a, a little bit too uh, precious about your writing when you're starting out. And you assume that, you know, once the word is committed to the page, it, it, is, it is set there and, and, and it really shouldn't be removed in any way. And of course, once you actually have to do that, and then you make the thing a bit leaner and you think, well, does this scene actually serve it for any particular purpose? Um, no, and then off it goes. And so you can cut out huge chunks of stuff very, very easily. And what it made me aware of, and it's something that's stayed with me since, is that everything that you publish um, is a work in progress. You know, you shouldn't sort of try and get to a stage where you think, OK, this is perfect, and now it can go off to the, the printer. Because it, if you were to pick it up in, a, in a, another year's time, look back over it, you'd still find you know, something that you'd want to change. So you just have to get it into a shape that is good enough to submit to the publisher, and then you can edit it some more, and then it goes out. And otherwise, you end up in this kind of um, rut where a lot of people who go to the creative writing MA courses um, we'll do things like they. I remember having dinner with one uh, a few months back, and she said, "Yes, I've been writing my first novel now for four years, and I've got half of it done." When I'm thinking, well, then that's never going to be a career, is it? Um, if you, if that's the approach you adopt, uh, so you have to you 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 know you have to take a kind of realist approach to this if you want to make a living out of it. That it isn't about getting a perfect work of writing out there in, in, into the things you're never going to do it it's always going to be imperfect from somebody's perspective and you also have to take into account the fact that you're only doing 50 percent of the work at most because at the end of the day you know you pick up a book that's what the punter gets black marks on white paper and um, they have to then recreate from those black marks uh, a vision of the world that you want to try and uh, communicate to them so they're doing something immensely creative so they're doing the other half of the the process and that, of course, means that you're going to end up with as many different versions of the reality you've created and put down in the heads of those people who read it. And of course, that's why books are so much better than films, because films are uh, simply the tyranny of the director's vision, whereas every individual who buys a book and reads it creates a unique experience. And I think that's always going to be the advantage of books. In terms of your own writing speed, I mean, you've, you've obviously written, uh, you must write quite quickly, given you've written 20 books in one series and, and several others. Um, how many, how long does it take you to produce that first draft? And then how many drafts do you do before you submit it to your agent or publisher? These days, only one draft, because, um, you know, I, I, uh, you know I, I know what I'm doing sufficiently well that um, I can sort of edit as I'm writing. Um, and then I will tidy it up and there'll be some any inconsistencies I'll tie up and then it goes off to the editor and then we will go through um, you know, some rewrites and copy edits and proof edits and things like that. So it, it doesn't take a, a huge, that side, it doesn't take a huge amount of time. I'm afraid, I have to sort of admit that I'm not one of these um, disciplined people who gets up at six o'clock in the morning, writes 2,000 words, has lunch, and another 2,000 words and so on. It tends to be the case that I'm enjoying the research so much that... Um, I only start writing when I get a call from my editor and she says something along the lines of, Simon, that book that you're going to be handing in in two months' time, how's it going? Um, and that's the point at which I kind of settle down very, <laughs> really carried away. So uh, it's, um, it used to be that I used to probably spend about three, three and a half months writing a book, um, fueled by Tenant Super and Peanut Butter Sandwiches, because I discovered that Tenant Super slowed down my thinking process to my typing speed. Um, so it was 500 mil, you know, I don't know if you know them, but it's these lovely 500 mil cans of intensely strong lager. 
um, and it does a brilliant job of kind of they're quite popular with like homeless people they are yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well it's special brew or ted and super isn't it yeah <laughs> but um i found it worked really well for me uh, but now I, I i just find that uh i'm old enough that coffee does the job this is my favorite writing tip we've had on the on the show so far by the way <laughs> go on simon <laughs> um I, I was yeah, it, it definitely very. It is it's it's a novelty for always take notes. Um, can we talk about series? Did you always envisage that Under the Eagle would be a series? And you you you've quipped before that series are useful when you've got a mortgage to pay. Like what were you were you thinking about this from the from the get go? Was it just how things worked out? Well, yeah, I, I wanted to write a um, a series. Uh, you know, following a, a bunch of squaddies um, in in the Roman army. I didn't want you know I wanted to sort of see the Roman Empire from the worm's eye view. Um, and I had thought of, when I started out, I was thinking 10, 12 books. My agent sort of said, well, be realistic and, and say six. And my publisher was saying, well, we may get four or five out of this. So everybody has kind of different perceptions of, of, of where this goes. And um, as it's, you know, I, d- I had no idea it was going to get to 20. And I'm still well short of where I wanted to be. I mean, I, I thought by this stage I would be, you know, um, at the in 69 AD, year of the four emperors, uh, but it hasn't worked out. So everything's going a little bit slower than I thought it would in terms of getting through the years. Um, but the flip side of that, of course, is it means that there's a possibility of writing more novels. But I think this, you know, if, you, if you're going to be serious about writing fiction, one of the best things you can do, if, you, if you're thinking about doing this as a career, is to have a series. Um, my brother Alex, uh, when he was starting out, I, because, you know, I, I read about this, uh, I think kind of uh, Bernard Cornwall wrote uh, an essay on this for, I think it was the Writers and Artists Yearbook. You know, they have um, writing historical fiction and he submitted an essay and it kind of gets reproduced every so often in the Writers and Artists Yearbook. And he says that, you know, it's really, really important for your financial security to get a series going. Um, and, I, and I took that lesson to heart and I thought, OK, well, I will get Macro and Cato up and running. And then I can sort of do some side projects like the, um, the four books on Wellington and Napoleon um, and uh, things like, you know, Playing with Death, this uh, technological thriller I did with one of my ex-students. Um, so, you know, you have to think about financial security if you're serious about making a career about it. If you want to be um, uh, to write you know, the great literary novel, um, so many of those things just turn out to be Big words, small print, low sales, you know, and that, that really isn't a, a, a wise career move, frankly. It sounds like you had a sort of arc for the series mapped out in your head. Is that something that you've, I mean, you've not, you say you've not really stuck to it. So it's gone slower than you anticipated. But when you, you know, decided you were going to write a series, did you, you know, have it kind of plotted out? No. I mean, I don't even have the books plotted out. Um, so... I don't have any, I mean, I know uh, now, it's, you know, where the next four books are going to be because I had to actually write the synopses in order to get the next book deal. Uh, but chances are they will change a lot anyway. That's just to get the deal. Um, but in, in terms of each book, I mean, I just have a, a half a side of A4, which is essentially um, where the book's going to be set, who the main villain is going to be, and the big problem they have to solve. Um, and then... Um, I get I get started with the writing, I and mean, that's partly because I have tried writing things out in very planned ways, and it's just not as much fun. Um, I like to find out what's going to happen along with the characters as it's happening. So, and frequently they will say things and think events will occur that I just hadn't anticipated or planned for, and when that happens, you know, it's it's really exciting. What's it like handling a completely different historical period? So, say with your Napoleon and um, Arthur Wellesley books, you know, how do you how do you keep those things in your head concurrently? And is there a difference researching something that is eighteenth and nineteenth century as opposed to two thousand years ago? Well, so- I mean, you, you've got two problems. Firstly, um, you know, Napoleon and uh, you know Wellington are real people. So, um, and there are vast amounts of information written about them, and there's a big historical record. Um, if I'd known that when I started out, I probably wouldn't have started because uh, having got the deal and started writing the first book, I discovered there was something, the bibliography on Napoleon runs through over 100,000 titles. Um, and I thought, <laughs> why am I doing reading all those before I start writing? So, um, you know, it's, it's a difficult one. Um, and it requires a lot more research. And also, um, 
it is a much more rigid and regimented way of writing because you know they are in a in a particular place at a particular time and certain things happen and you can only play liberally around with some of that and also at the same time what you can do which historians can't do is to get into the head and you know think try to sort of reconstruct what they might be thinking at a particular time so um it, that was a, that was a real challenge and I wanted to write it in a way that was different from the way I'd written the Macro and Cato books. So, you know, you are every time I sit down to do a new project like that, I, I tend to try and think, OK, I want this to actually sound different in my own head when I'm writing it, in the hope that when people are reading it, they'll, they'll still enjoy it and they'll still, you know, the same people will probably buy it. But at the same time, they're getting a, a, a different experience. Um, it isn't simply you know, just a Macro and Cato in a different kind of uh, 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 you know, costumes and stuff like that. So um, th that's how I go, I go about it. And something like uh, Blackout. Um, so, you know, it's a, again, it, it's a slightly different genre insofar as it's crime. It's historical crime, true, but it's crime. And it's a different way of doing things as well. You have to kind of, if you, you know who the guilty person is at the, uh, the start, and you have to kind of work back and see the clues. So that, that element of it is far more structured than a Macro and Cato book. Um, and also, you know, again, this, you know, my thing is not just Roman history. I mean, I tend to get labelled with as you know the, the Roman history guy, and in actual fact, my history, you know, interest in history is, is far wider. Um, and it's simply because of, you know, I, I like history, full stop. I mean, that's where all the best stories are, uh, without a shadow of a doubt. And I'm also very passionate about the potential for history uh, as a way of teaching people, to, you know, to make better decisions and certainly as better policy. Uh, but unfortunately, that rarely seems to happen. I had lunch with Paddy Ashdown some years ago, and we were talking about Afghanistan. And uh, he was saying, "Yeah, yeah, you know, this time we're going to, you know, it's going to go well, and you know, we're on it." And I said, "Well, you know, how many times has the British Army been involved in Afghanistan before? You know, you know, two or three times. And how many of those worked out really well for us?" You know, and he said, "Well, you know, uh, so why should it be different this time?" And um, he said, "Well, because you know, because it is." And, um, and I think you know that kind of thing really worries me. Is that lack of historical perspective am amongst policymakers, and, uh, and this, this this kind of idea that somehow you know history is lovely and it's very picturesque and mythical and national and nationalistic and narrative in the past and all this sort of stuff, and it tells us who we are. But then they don't seem to actually sit down and learn the lessons from it. And I'm sure you share this kind of frustration, given the book that you've written. Um, <laughs> Yeah, when the lessons are so evident, but we don't seem to be embracing yeah, as, think, as speedily as we might. I think it's very true. I, I, I wanted to come back to, to Blackout in a moment, but could we touch just on, on your experience of co-writing with Invader and Pirata? Like, how, how does that actually work? When you, do you sit down with someone or do you alternate chapters, edit each other? Like, how do you how do, you do that piece? Well, um, with Tim, uh, Tim's, um, uh, you know, he's, he's uh, very interested in his kind of military history. So um, we've got a lot in common, and it's it's a really interesting thing to actually sit down with someone who knows about that you know that you share an interest in that particular period, and um, and he's written quite a few he's, he's done quite a few co-written projects before. I mean he does um, oh, God, I can't suppose I can tell you actually because he, he 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 does most of the writing for a very very famous person put it that way. So um, Tim you know he's got quite a lot of experience. And when you're sitting down, you know, we, we, we're working on a project at the moment, um, which is set in, in uh, Roman Britain, uh, but it's from a completely different kind of perspective. So we, you know, we, we have an idea for a story, then he bounces an idea one way, we bounce back. So there's plenty of kind of, OK, well, we could do this, we could do that. Um, and, it, and you feel it's really, really nice to know, to feel confident enough when someone is reading your ideas and commenting on it uh, that you can you can trust their judgment and if they come up with something better you say yes we'll go with that and then you say something and they go ah great and that means we could do this and so suddenly there's this sort of explosion of possibilities uh, which you have to kind of refine down to a, a, a synopsis so this for this first book I mean it's very different from the way I write the Macro and Cato books so we've been through the first one in, in quite a lot of detail and we've now got the latest version is a 10-page synopsis of this first novel that we're going to co-write and I started off so 
because we're going to have two very different narrative voices in this. So I'm taking charge of the, the Roman end of it. And um, Tim will take charge of the kind of British end of it. But we will constantly sort of send our material to each other for uh, improvements and tinkering. And that works really, really well. And the same thing with um, uh, Playing With Death, the uh, techno thrill I wrote with my former student, Lee. And um, he went into the film industry after he left university and um, had a pretty bad experience of it, actually, because... Uh, you know, it's all very glamorous and so on, but it's um, it's a thorough nepotocracy. Uh, you know, anybody um, who's sort of well connected, whose dad was a producer or mum was a, a a star or something like this, you know, the whole thing kind of generates all sorts of jobs for people in the industry. And outsiders uh, are a bit of a rarity, and when they are there, they're treated with complete contempt. So he was working on the the woman in black, and uh, basically. Um, he he kind of rewrote the script because it was just going completely mad in Hollywood in a very, very big way. And he had to pull the project back. So he has a very much a cinematic uh, way of doing things. And um, he's great on dialogue. So we sort of sat down to do this, this techno throw because I was very interested in this idea of VR and, um, and AI, you know, and how the two cross over and, and have certain sorts of potential. This goes back to an idea I had about, oh gosh, now 25 years ago. So we, we, we sat down and wrote it in a similar way that I did with Tim. So it's a case of write a chunk, send it over. It gets edited, a new chunk is added, that gets sent back. I then edit the chunk that he's just done, write the next bit, and it sort of goes backwards and forwards that way. And I found that really very creative way to work. Um, I wouldn't like to do it all the time because uh, I'm a bit of a control freak and you know I wouldn't do the same thing for Macro and Cato. I would not co-write a Macro and Cato book because simply you know I don't think the guys would like me to. <laughs> uh, and since they live in my head and tell you know um, that's that's where they are and I don't think um, they particularly would like that uh, duty shared with anybody else. Sounds a bit that's mad. But... Doesn't at all. Um... I was interested to see that the Parata books were published as ebooks first. Is that right? What was the decision behind that? Um, well, it was we uh, headline when they um, started paying out some really large money on the deals. Um, somebody in the marketing said, "Well, we need to get a marketing expert in to to think about ways in which we can build the brand." And so they hired this guy um, who had run an advertising company, sold it up, and set himself up as some sort of guru. And he said, well, what we need to do is kind of do these, sh you know, like short shots of these things and have an end of level boss and, and treat it like a computer game. So the first book we wrote was this thing called um, Arena, which was about a gladiator. So every at the end of each episode, there would be a sort of boss to fight. And at the end of it, there was the big boss at the end of it. And that's how he kind of constructed it. So Tim was pulled in. We worked out you know, a series of plots for this and did it. And I have very mixed views about this because it's it's good to have, you know, put out a regular bit of fiction at a lower price and so on. But it, there's a certain amount of resistance in the market to this because I was getting reviews from people who, you know, you do this and then you have the bind up at the end of it. So and they would say and they would feel somehow, oh, well, we could have waited till the bind up came along. We could have got it marginally cheaper. What a con man you are. So um, there is a certain amount of resistances up to that in the market, as I say. So um, we've done three of those now. And the one we're working on at the moment, the, the publisher has actually still got that in mind. But uh, Tim and I have sort of said already, look, we're, we're writing the entire thing first. And then we would really rather it went straight out in hardback. Um, but if you know, you're know you going to be hard asked about the contract, then we, you know, we'll do it the way you wanted it originally. But I'm not sure that, um, I mean, it's kind of, some people like it, some people really hate it. Um, and I'd really rather not take the risk if you're, you know, doing something that affects your brand. So it's a rule of the show that we always ask about money and how it affects people's writing lives. You've, you've mentioned a number of things with it before and, you know, be as candid or as guarded as you want. But how has that changed? And when, when did the big money uh, come and, and what impact did that make? We had um, a little while ago Ian Rankin on the show, and he recalled being in like a motel in the US in a snowstorm and his wife sending him a royalty statement and him thinking that it had a typo on because there were like too many zeros or whatever. But when, how, did, how did the financial side of your writing 
develop. Well, I mean, it's interesting, actually, because I, I, I had a chat with Ian up in uh, Shetland when we were at literary festivals together, and he said, um, he said, you know, it took me seven books to become an overnight success. Um, <laughs> and for a lot of that time, he was living on £5,000 a year on a small holding. Um, so one of the, my first agents said to me, look, because I said, oh, you know, I've got a, a writing contract. I'm going to be a writer. Yippee. And she said, look, um, don't give up the day job. OK, the, the, the reality is that most authors go on to make fairly kind of minimal amounts of money and um, don't, you know, hedge everything on, on getting this contract. So I basically carried on teaching and um, and I, you know, I'll be honest with you, I really miss being a teacher. It's a great job. I really enjoyed it. And writing was the hobby. And after a while, uh, and it was about five or six books in, um, I think it was Centurion, uh, suddenly just sort of zoomed up in the charts for some reason. Uh, and I don't know why. Um, it was partly because we changed the, the, the titling, because up to that point, it had been the Eagle something in every, in every one of the titles. And then some marketing guy said, well, let's just call it Centurion. And, uh, and I was a little bit kind of, you know, I don't know about that. And, you know, I don't know how much that had to do with the success or if it was just because the thing had reached in a sort of natural point where the sales were going to go up. But it suddenly it was, um, you know, a Sunday Times bestseller. And um, from at that point, you know, everything was fairly kind of secure. And the, suddenly the publisher wants more books and two books a year and things like this. So I was beginning to uh, get quite a lot of pressure in a way because... I was teaching and suddenly the publisher wanted two books a year. You can teach and write one book a year relatively easily. But suddenly when it becomes two books, then you're feeling under the cosh a bit. And I was having lunch with um, a, a historical novelist, a friend of mine called uh, Chris Humphreys, who I think is you know, one of the, the people who should be major, you know, a massive success. But you know, he's had a bad publisher and that's just the way these things go. And I was saying, look, it's a real problem. And he just asked me a very interesting question. He said, look, Simon, how much are you making from teaching? And I told him, he said, how much are you making from writing? And, and then he just looked at me and went. So um, and that's the point I thought, oh, yes, so you, you can actually become a full-time writer. And that's the point at which I thought I'd take a sabbatical from teaching. And of course, I've never gone back. Um, and the, I suppose the big, the big gear shift came when another publisher was interested in poaching me. and um, I was coming towards the end of a contract at Headline and this other publisher came up and, and sort of um, somebody I'd known at Headline had gone on to this other publisher and they said, oh, we should do lunch sometime. You know, and of course, as so is often the case in these things, whenever um, uh, publishers and agents take you out for lunch, something, it is never for friendship. <laughs> OK, there's always another agenda. And so then he said, oh, I'm coming up to Norwich sometime with, uh, on business. I'll drop in for dinner. And so, you know, we did, had some dinner, did some shooting and stuff. And, um, and then he said, well, Simon, you know, I'd really like you to, you know, build your career with you. And so he came up with this offer. And my agent went back to Headline and said, look, you know, we, we've, we've um, thinking about moving because uh, we've had this, this offer. And then I had two, it was a really interesting reaction. So Headline sent two couriers to me on the same morning. The first one arrived with a letter threatening me with legal action if I went to this other publisher. And the second one arrived with an offer for the next deal that was above the price offered by the second publisher. So, um, and, and that's when things just went a bit bonkers after that. So, and luckily, the way things tend to work in publishing is uh, as long as things are going relatively okay, Whenever they um, offer you a certain thing, that's a f that becomes the new sort of benchmark from which you negotiate up. Um, so things have worked out quite well, certainly well enough to sort of pay for one messy divorce and get remarried. So it, it's, it's working out OK. I like that approach of both carrot and stick simultaneously. Yeah, I was still quite impressed by that. Um, and I thought, well, you know, if that's your uh, stick, I'm OK, you know, because the carrot's so nice. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, we're coming towards the end of our time, but could you tell us a little bit more about Blackout um, and what you've learned about thriller writing and, and I guess just also give us a kind of potted synopsis for listeners? Yeah, I mean, uh, this this was uh, something that occurred to me when I, I, I wanted to write a book set in Alderney um, during the Second World War, because it was the, the only place on British soil that the Germans had built a concentration camp. And it's a really fantastic island. It's it's. Have you ever been to Alderney? 
Oh, you should go sometime. No, I, I have. It is like Curran Island from Famous Five. It's sort of three and a half miles long, one and a half miles wide. Beautiful, craggy, rocky, sandy, clear waters. It's, it's castles everywhere. It's lovely. So um, I thought this would be a brilliant setting to have some sort of whodunit on this very, very kind of tiny little island in the, in, in the English Channel. And then, of course, it occurred to me that the person who'd be sent there as, to investigate this would be sent there as a punishment, because that's what Alderney was. It was where, you know, you got sent if you'd done something wrong. And I thought, well, in which case, what has he done back in Berlin that would get him sent there? So I started researching that. And then I thought, well, Berlin is you know, where this series starts because um, it's such a, I mean, it's an amazing city. But uh, right at the start of the war in 39, there's a very widespread feeling that the war is going to be over very early in, in, in 1940 because Poland had been wiped off the map. Poland was the cause of the war. And so they assumed that the British and the French would think, well, you know, there's no point to this. So the, there would be peace in 40, early in 40. So there's a very interesting um, atmosphere. You've got this kind of guarded optimism. You've got one of the worst winters on record in 1939 into 40. You've got the blackout, which completely changes the nature of the city. So, um, you know, as soon as it's dark, suddenly no street lights, cars have, and bikes have these tiny sort of slits on the, the lamps and so on. Um, the, you know, accidents go up, loads more people die. The blackout works as a brilliant kind of cover for cr criminals of any, of any event. Um, and I thought, well, what, you know, what an amazing setting to begin the series and have a, a serial killer on the loose, aided by the blackout um, at a time when you know, the war was just kicking off, but also under a regime that is um, staggeringly dictatorial and, and, and vicious and nasty with it. And how do you actually be a good policeman in, in, in a system that is so thoroughly corrupt and evil? And that is going to be the sort of major challenge across this series of books. So, um, and of course, one of the, you know, the, the, the awful things about writing something like Blackout now is that you're beginning to see so many of the same tropes of um, early Nazi you know, history repeating themselves in Britain. Um, you know, I, I've, I mean, I've had death threats from people because I've offered a slightly uh, different view of, 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 you know, I'm a patriot, but I'm not a nationalist. And I've sort of said things on, on you know, Facebook forums and stuff and had death threats. And I've, I've told the police about this. <laughs> and their view is very much like, well, you know, you'd be surprised how many we get these days, you know, that these things that we have to do. So make a you know, record of it all. So I've got all the files on the comments and stuff. And if anything happens to you, then we'll have the evidence. Oh. <laughs> how comforting <laughs> so um blackout is uh i mean it's going to be interesting i hope i really hope that all the things that the government's doing at the moment um you know will not lead to uh, anything remotely like uh, the situation in nazi germany but as i said earlier you know history is there to teach us lessons history there is there to kind of um show us kind of archetypes prototypes of of, of certain policy and certain behavior and it, it is a little worrying watching what's going on in the world whilst writing a book about Nazi Germany and being terribly conscious about parallels that keep cropping up. We are right up against our time limit now, but that seems a very um, thought-provoking place to, to end the conversation. Simon, thank you for being a, a fantastic guest and taking us through your career and speaking so candidly and wishing you all the best with um, everything going forward. Thank you, and I, and I hope your book does wonders for you. Thank you. That was the Always Take Notes interview with Simon Scarrow. You can find him on Twitter at Simon Scarrow. His website is simonscarrow.co.uk and his latest novels include Blackout and The Emperor's Exile. Hello, it's us again. Rachel, what were your takeaways from the Simon Scarrow interview? I think we covered a lot of interesting ground in this, but I found the discussion of co-writing particularly insightful. It was a subject we haven't, or at least I haven't covered uh, with the guests on Always Take Notes during my tenure. So learning more about how the logistics of that kind of project works in practice uh, was was really enjoyable. What about you? What was your main takeaway? Well, I think, Rachel, you've had um, recent experience with co-writing with your um, your investigation of the England footballers' haircuts. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Um, which is, I've resisted from tweeting it out every time England have played, but maybe I should be... Uh, Maybe I should be doing that. Yeah, <laughs> I think you should be. I think you should be um, 
be touting it, touting it relentlessly. Um, I also really enjoy the interview with Simon. I mean, I think with these, the word kind of professional is something that's come to mind with a few guests we've had on the show recently, William Boyd as well, people who seem to just have really kind of mastered the craft of their art, as it were, who have a system and a kind of a rigour with doing it, and that, that by bringing that kind of discipline to their creative endeavours, they're, they're very fruitful and very successful with it. And also great to have another historical novelist on after our recent interview with Kate, Kate Morris. Um, anyway, this has been Always Take Notes, hosted by me, Simon Aikham. And me, Rachel Lloyd. Our producer and social media editor is Artemis Irvin. Our score is by Jess Danheiser, and our graphic design is by James Edgar. If you'd like to follow us on social media, you can find us on Facebook and Instagram at Always Take Notes, on Twitter at Take Notes Always. If you'd like to support us via our crowdfunding page on Patreon, we're on there as Always Take Notes. And if you'd like to get in touch with us via our website, please do. Many thanks. Goodbye.